morning everyone today we'll cover functions uh, and next class we'll have the midterm exam as uh, we stated before uh, we for the midterm two exam we'll basically ask questions from sequences and mathematical induction and set theory okay so there is a sample exam posted in uh, piazza uh, for uh, the midterm and today, as I said, we'll cover functions. So what exactly is a function? A function is defined from a set X called a domain to a set Y called a codomain. And here we have a, an example F defined on X with values in Y. With the following two requirements. The first requirement is that every element in X is related to some element in Y. So for every uh, element in X, F of X will be equal with some element in Y. Second requirement is that no element in X is related to more than one element in Y. So basically for every element X in the domain X, uppercase X, there is a unique element Y that belongs to the codomain y, uppercase y, such that f of x is equal with y. The range of f or the image of x under f is the set of all the y's in the codomain such that y is equal with an f of x for some x in the domain. So the range is basically the uh, subset of y that are values that correspond to a value in the domain. So again, a function is a relation between a domain, a set called the domain, and a set called the codomain with two requirements. The first requirement is that every element in the domain will have a value in the codomain. And the second requirement is that every element in the domain has a single value in the codomain. The inverse image of an, of an element in the codomain is that set of elements in the domain such that f of x is equal with y, or y is equal with some f of x. Okay. The easiest way to understand functions are with arrow diagrams. An arrow diagram is basically a set of arrows that start from the domain x, the set of elements in the domain x, to the set of elements in the codomain y. And again, for a function to be well defined, every element of x in the domain must have an arrow coming out of it. So basically it has an arrow going from x into an element in y. And no element in x has two arrows coming out of it. So there is no element here that has two arrows or three or more uh, arrows coming out of it, okay, to two different points in Y. So here are some examples of functions and relations that are not functions. So we have the set X is the finite set of elements A, B, and C. The set Y is the finite set of values 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we can see an arrow diagram with two arrows, one coming from A to 1, and one co coming from C to 3 is not a function because B does not have uh, a value corresponding to it in, in the second set in the codomain. The second arrow diagram with one arrow going from A to 1, one arrow going from B to 2, one arrow going from C to 2, and another arrow going from C to 3 is also not a function because C has two arrows going out of it. So there are two values in the codomain, two and three, that correspond to the value of the function on C. And finally, we have an arrow diagram that is a function. We can see that from the domain that contains the elements A, B, and C, from every element goes out one and one only one arrow to an element in the codomain. So this is actually the best example that we can see for a function that every element in the domain has an outgoing arrow to an element in the codomain 
and in the codomain we can see that not all elements must to be must be covered so the range of this function is actually the set that contains the elements one and three so only one and three from the codomain that contains one two three and four are actually images of elements through this function from the domain so here we have an example of a correct function again the domain was a b and c and the codomain was uh, one two three and four and we have arrows going from a to two from b to four and from c to two and we can see that there are basically two ways to define this function the first is through the arrow diagram the second is actually to state for every element what is its mapping uh, through that function so f of a is two f of b is four and f of c is two so now we can actually see all of the things that we defined before the terminology for functions the domain of the function is the set a b and c x the codomain of the function is the set one two three and four the set y the range of the function are those elements in the codomain that are actually mappings of elements in the domain and those were two and four the inverse image of two so basically those incoming arrows that go into two are coming from the elements a and c so the inverse image of an element or even of a subset uh, on, in the codomain is basically the set of elements in the domain whose mapping is that value or a value in that subset the inverse image of four is the set that contains b so basically only b goes into four the inverse image of one is empty set and so is the inverse image of three is also the empty set and you can also see a function as a set of pairs now this is more common for relationships but we can also think of a function and it's easy to remember when we talked about cartesian product that a tuple is basically a set of elements where one element starts uh, one element is a member of, of one set and the other element is a member of uh, another set so we can represent a function as a set of pairs or tuples and in this case the set contains a2 b4 and c2 so one thing that we can see here is that in fact the function is a set of tuples that is a subset of the cartesian product between the two sets so x and y cartesian product will give us all possible pairs of one element belonging to x and another element belonging to y a function is basically a set that is a subset of that cartesian product with the two constraints that we saw earlier that for every element in the domain we have one tuple that contains that element at least one tuple the second uh, constraint is that there is only one tuple there are no two tuples in the uh, in, in the set of pairs such that the first element is the same now we can define function equality and because we define the set notation for a function basically that for every f of x equal with y we have a pair x y that belongs to f basically this is a set equality between the set representations of two functions so if f is a function defined on the domain x with the values in the codomain y and g is a function defined on the domain x with values in the codomain y and these two are functions then the set representation of the function f is equal with the set representation of the function g if and only if f of x is equal with g of x for all x in the domain x so now the proof is that first of all we need to define properly what are the set representations of a function so f is a subset of the cartesian product between x and y and so is g is a subset of the cartesian product of x and y if f of x is equal with y then the tuple x y is a member of f 
this the set representation of the function if g of x is equal with y if only and only if x y as a tuple as a pair belongs to g the set representation of that function so now the theorem that we have above that two functions are equal for all for in their set representation if and only if f of x is equal with g of x for all x in the domain x has two directions we have to prove that if f is equal with g the set representations of the function that implies that f of x is equal with g of x for all x belonging in uh, the, the domain and then the, because the, we have if and only if we have the opposite direction if f of x is equal with g of x for all x in the domain x then f is equal with g the set representations so we'll prove both directions we start first with assuming that f is equal with g that means that for all x in the domain f of x is equal with y means that x y is a tuple in f but since f is equal with g as two sets that means that x y as a tuple also belongs to g and that is true if and only if g of x is equal with y as the definition of the set representation of a function so now we can see that f of x is equal with y but y is also equal with g of x so f of x will be equal with g of x for all x in the domain now we also know that since this was a functional representation as a set we must have the fact and these are functions we must have the case that for every x there is only one tuple x y that belongs to f and therefore there will be only one tuple x y that belongs to g the other direction is actually to prove that if f of x is equal with g of x for all x in the domain x then we also have f is equal with g now again by the function representation of uh, f of x is equal with g of x or the function representation of f there is a tuple x y that belongs to f if and only if y is equal with f of x but since f of x is equal to g of x that means that g of x is equal with y which means that if y is equal with uh, g of x then x y as a tuple belongs to g so for every element in f we also get that that element that tuple belongs to g and these are if and only if statements so basically it also means that for every element in g every tuple x y in g it also belongs to f so f and g consist of exactly the same elements and hence the two sets are equal basically if you can prove through the method of direct proof that every for every element in one set it's also an element e in the other set and vice versa then the two sets must be equal uh, sorry can you hear me yes please uh, I, I don't really understand what's the difference between the first proof and the second proof uh, so the first proof basically what we want to prove is the forward direction basically that we want to prove that if f is equal with g as set representations then f of x for every x let me write it down is equal with g of x for every x in the domain so it's kind of the forward direction basically we from the first part we want to prove the second part and the second proof is the opposite basically we want to prove that if those two functions in the functional representation are equal then the two set representations are equal that f is equal with g 
So there are two basically directions that need to be proved, and that's because of the if and only if. So basically what we want to show here, and that's basically the point of this uh, proof, is that the set representation uh, of, uh, of a function has the same properties with the function definition of that function. And we are proving that if the two set representations are equal, then the two functions are equal. So first we actually define, we are basically defining first what is the set representation of a function. And this is the definition. And then we have a theorem that we basically are saying that if the two set representations are equal, then the two functions are equal. So we are basically stating when two functions, when we say that two functions are equal, when their set representations are equal. And vice versa, we say that the two functions are equal for all elements in the domain when the two function uh, functions defined as sets are equal. So we basically have a definition on the set notation of a function. And then we have a theorem that states that two functions are equal when they are equal uh, for all elements. And that is equivalent with proving that the set representations for the functions are equal. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, in fact, I think it would help if we actually state, we, we show bold the two definitions basically, the two directions, okay? Okay, so let's actually take an example. So for instance, we have a domain G3, with a tree, which is uh, the set that contains elements zero, one, and two. And we have two functions. We have f of x defined with from G3 to G3, and is defined as f of x is equal with x squared plus x plus one modulo three, and g that is defined from the same domain with the same codomain, but is defined with a different function. And we can see that the two formulas are not equal. This is x plus two squared modulo three, and this is x squared plus x plus one modulo three. Now, again, we want to show that the two functions are equal. That is our question. Are these two functions equal? And we can actually enumerate the values in the set because this is a finite set. So X can take values in the domain, zero, one, and two. Then X squared plus X plus one, basically the sub formula that belongs to F of X, are X squared plus X plus one is one for X equals zero because X squared and X is, one, is zero. It's three if x square uh, for x equal one, because x square is one, x is one plus one is three. And for two, we have x squared is four plus two for x plus one, four plus two plus one is seven. Now, f of x will be the value of that sub formula, x squared plus x plus one, modulo three, the remainder after division with three. One modulo three is equal with one, 3 modulo 3 is equal with 0, and 7 modulo 3 is equal with 1. Because after division with, uh, of 7 with 3, we get 6 is the multiple of 3, and the remainder 1. Similarly, we can compute g. g is equal with x plus 2 square modulo 3. So first we compute x plus 2 square, which will be for x equals 0, it's four, it's zero plus two to the power two, it's two to the power two, which is four. Four one will be three to the power two, which is nine. And four two will be four to the power two, which is 16. G of X will be X plus two square modulo three. Four modulo three is equal with one. Nine modulo three is equal with zero. And 16 modulo three is equal with one. So now we can actually see that F of X is equal with G of X for all x in the domain. Therefore, f is equal with g. The same thing we could have proven by taking the tuples. So f as a top, as a set, is equal with the, the set of pairs 0, 1, 1, 3, 
and 2, 7, and so is G. Basically, G will be equal with the tuples 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, sorry, uh, we were looking at F of X. So F is equal with 0, 1, 1, 0, 2, 1, and so is G. That's why the two uh, sets are actually equal. And we can actually write it down. So this is the set definition of, uh, of that set. So let me show that this is in fact equal with the sets. Let me write down this first, and then we'll write the three pairs. So for x equals zero, we have the value one of the functions, both functions. For x equal one, we have the value zero of both functions, and for two, we also have one. So we can see that the two functions are actually equal. And it doesn't matter if we write them as functions of every element, or the two set notations of those functions, which are basically the sets of pairs, where the first argument belongs to the domain and the second argument to the codomain. So basically we prove that these two functions are equal. Another two functions and two more properties of uh, functions. So let's consider the functions f and g defined on reals with values in the codomain reals. And we can define f plus g and g plus f. Also as functions from reals to reals. And they are defined as follows. f plus g of x is equal with f of x plus g of x. And f uh, g plus f of x is equal with g of x plus f of x for all x in the domain r. For all real numbers, now we can actually see that f of x plus g of x, uh, f, plus, uh, f plus g of x is f of x plus g of x, and that was the definition of f plus g. Then g of, uh, because of commutativity for addition, f of x plus g of x is equal with g of x plus f of x. And now by definition of g plus f of x, we can actually re rewrite that as g plus f of x. Hence, it doesn't matter what the functions f and g are, as long as they are defined on reals and we define f plus g and g plus f as defined above, we can basically say that the two functions are equal. f plus g is equal with g plus f. And the reason for that is that for every element in the domain, f plus g of x is equal with g plus f of x. And again, we prove the function equality for these two functions, f plus g and g plus x, f, for every element in the domain. And in fact, for every function, f and g. Now, there are a couple of functions that are important in mathematics. And probably the first one is the identity function on a set. So given a set x, i of x, the identity function on that set x, is a function defined from x to x and is called the identity function if and only if i of x of any element x in the domain for every element x in the domain is equal with itself. So we'll, we'll see later that basically this identity function is a very important function. We can compose with it and we get the same function. We can uh, compute its inverse and it is the same function. Uh, we, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, it's basically a one-to-one -one function for every element in the domain. We basically have itself in the codomain, we cover the entire codomain, and every element in the codomain has only one arrow, if you think about uh, arrow diagrams uh, as, a, as a function. Basically, we, we have every element in the codomain is the mapping of one element and exactly one element in from the domain. So it's a very important function in mathematics and probably the first one that will define, define properly and will use it in composition, inverse and one-to-one -one, uh, functions and onto functions. Another example of a function is a sequence. 
So remember that sequences were basically sequences of elements, like for instance, one minus one over two, one over three, minus one over four, and so on. And this can be an infinite sequence for every element in the uh, integers, uh, the correspondence, the, fun the element in the sequence is minus one to the power n divided by n plus one. And you see that it actually maps the elements that we have before. It maps uh, one minus one to the power zero for uh, uh, n equals zero divided by n plus one will be basically one divided by one, by uh, one uh, and this one. And similarly for i equal one, we have minus one to the power one divided by one by uh, plus one is minus one over two. So now you consider you can consider the sequence to be a function, basically for every n, starting for n greater than or equal with zero, n is mapped to minus one to the power n divided by n plus one. So we can define the function f that is defined on natural numbers that includes zero with values in r, and this actually defines that sequence for every integer n greater than or equal with a zero f of n is equal with minus 1 to the power n divided by n plus 1. So it's a function that actually represents a sequence. For every index, it gives you the element of the sequence. Now, g, uh, we can actually write a different but equivalent equal function representation for this function. With the, is not quite equal function because it's defined on a different domain but it's a function that represents the same sequence with the exception that the index starts from one instead of starting from, z, uh, from uh, zero. Z plus is the set of positive integers. So integers that are strictly greater than zero. So this function G for every integer N greater than or equal with one, G of N will be minus one to the power N plus one divided by N. So it's basically a function that basically maps to the same sequence of elements. So you can see sequences as functions. That's why this is not totally new in CSC 215 because we saw sequences before. The power set of a set, given the set theory that we learned last class, can also be defined as a function. If you think of what's the cardinality of the power set. So the power set is basically, if you remember, the set of all the subsets of a set. So for instance, F in our case is defined on the power set of the set A, B, and C with values in non-negative integers. So basically natural numbers, N, that we saw before. For every x in the power set, f of x is the number of elements in x, basically the cardinality of x. So remember what was the power set of uh, a set ABC, are basically all the subsets of the set ABC. And here are all the subsets, first empty set, then the set that contains A, the set that contains B, the set that contains C, the set that contains AB, the set that contains AC, the set that contains BC and the set that contains ABC. Now our function F gives us for every element in this domain, which is a power set of ABC, the cardinality of that set. So the empty set is mapped to zero, the set that contains A is mapped to one, and so are the sets that contains B and the set that contains C. Then the set that contains two elements, AB, AC and BC are mapped to two, and the set that contains A, B, C is mapped to three. And we see that because the codomain is the set of all non-negative integers, basically we have many other integers, but they are not after three, but they are not actually the mapping of, on, of any element in the domain, okay? So this is another example of a function. Next, Cartesian product example. So. Remember that we said that the Cartesian product of two sets is the set of tuples uh, in uh, those, uh, such that the first element belongs to the first set and the second element in the second set. Uh, 
and this can be extended to top uh, to Cartesian products of multiple sets. So now we can define two functions, m, which is defined on the Cartesian product of reals and reals. So given two reals, it gives us the product of those two reals. One thing that you notice already in uh, this example is that, in fact, the way that we think about this function is that it takes elements in the domain. But the elements in the domain are tuples. Basically, they are pairs of a real and another real. However, we omit the parentheses for tuples. So instead of writing double parentheses, M of the tuple AB, we just write M of AB. So this is a notation that is quite common because it maps programming. So if you ever used Java, if you took CSC 114 before, or you use Python, you took CSC 101 before, you have a function with multiple parameters. But really, this is a function that we have in mathematics. It's M, which takes a tuple with an order tuple, and tuple, with multiple parameters. So for instance, in our case, as examples, M of 1, 1 will be the product of 1 and 1. So it will return 1. M of 2, 2 is basically equal with 4, because it's 2 multiplied with 2, and so on. Another example. The reflection function is defined from uh, the Cartesian product of reals with reals into the Cartesian product of reals with reals. So it takes a pair of two reals and returns back also a pair of two reals. And this is an example that is possible to write in Python, for instance, as a programming language, because it can return tuples as the result uh, return value of uh, one function. So here we have an example, R of A and B is equal with my, uh, the tuple that contains minus A and B. So if you think of the Cartesian product as the possible Cartesian plane that contains pairs of X and Y coordinates, R is basically a function that sends each point in the plane to the corresponding pair of real numbers in the mirror image of that point across the vertical axis. So R of 1, 1 will be minus 1, 1. R of 2, 5 is minus 2, 5. And R of minus 2, 5 is 2 and 5. And let me actually show you this in paint, OK? So the Cartesian plane is basically a plane that contains two axes, x and y. So this is basically, let's consider it to be x. And we have the vertical axis, which is y. So these are pairs. So again, we have x on the horizontal axis, y on the vertical axis. And now, this function r that we want to define, some function r, will basically map every element. And let's actually put an element. Let's say that here is where 1, 1 is. Okay, And you can basically think of it as being basically a, a point in this space where x is equal with 1 and y is equal with 1. And this function r maps every element with its corresponding element mirrored on the y-axis. So it will be somewhere here. It's actually quite difficult to draw with the mouse, but it's good enough. And this element will basically be the r value. So Basically, this is R of 1 and 1, which is the pair minus 1 for the value of x and 1 for the value of y. So they both have the same y, which is 1, but they have opposite values for x. Okay, So this would be just 1. 
So this is the function R. We'll basically take every element and mirrored it on the y-axis. So if the element would be here, it would be mirrored somewhere here. So for for instance, for let's say uh, 1.5 and 2 or even 3, okay? Minus 1.5 and 3 will be mirrored in exactly the opposite way, mirrored way on the y-axis. So we'll have somewhere here 1.5 and 3. So the same point is mirrored on, uh, let me actually just draw it. So this, that's an element that probably is somewhere here. And it will be mirrored by the y-axis. So it will be an element here. That's basically it. So there are functions that the codomain is basically a tuple, like in this case. There are functions where the domain is a tuple, but the codomain is just a real number, like product, in this case, the multiplication function. So these are all functions. Logarithm, and this was a question actually in uh, Piazza uh, yesterday, that logarithms are functions and the base of the logarithm is a positive real number with the base different than one. The logarithm with base b of x is equal with y if and only if b to the power y is equal with x. And it's basically a logarithmic function is a function defined for any base b, but it's a function defined on the domain positive reals with values in reals. So for instance, logarithm in base three of nine is equal with two. And that is true because three to the power two is equal with nine. Logarithm in base 10 of one is equal with zero because what power do you uh, bring 10 to to be equal with one? It's zero. Again, logarithm in base two of one divided by two is equal with minus one because two to the power minus one is equal with one divided by two. In general, logarithm in base 2 of 2 to the power m is equal with m. And this applies to any base. Logarithm in base b of b to the some power m is equal with m because b to the power m is equal with m. Uh, b, to the, uh, b to the power m is equal with b to the power m, the value that we want to represent. Another example of functions are encoding and decoding functions. So these are extremely important in computer security. When you want to encode a function on one end, let's say Alice, and Alice sends a message to Bob, but she doesn't want anyone uh, that listens to their conversation to somewhere on the way to Bob to uh, understand what Bob, uh, what Alice means. So there are pair functions. Alice will encode her message and Bob will decode uh, the message. So for every string in some alphabet A, the encoding function on that string is the string obtained from S by replacing each bit, if we represent it in binary representation, by the same bit written three times. And basically, this is very easy to understand. You take one letter and you write it three times. Then Bob will use a decoding function that takes every string T and in the codomain of uh, the function E, but which can be exactly the same. It can be basically binary representations or it can be strings. And the decoding function is the string obtained from t by replacing each consecutive three tuples of identical bits by a single copy of that bit. So e of s is equal with t for all t in the uh, in the alpha in the domain t words t and d of t is equal with s. So we encoding function the decoding function. 
Now, this is a very easy function. It's a very simple uh, encoding function. As we can see, we basically uh, just repeat every letter. So it's easy to guess what the encoding function is to write the decoding function. But there are very difficult functions that one will take a long, long time to guess what is the encoding function. And usually, they are using prime numbers uh, that we learned in number theory last time. But we'll not get into that today. We'll not talk about how this encoding decoding might work in computer security. Also, another function that is very, very important for computer science is called the Hamming distance function. So the Hamming distance function is a function defined on uh, uh, Cartesian products of strings. So S of n is the set of all strings of 0 and 1s of length n. And the Hamming function is defined on set of uh, such pairs of two strings of the same size n with a value in non-negative integers. So one, one thing that you might learn when you, if you take a programming course, is that computer information is represented intern internally in computers with, in binary, zero and ones. Also, that these binary strings are usually sliced into slices of eight bits, called bytes. Now, compute uh, this kind of uh, messages, information is sent through noisy channels, like for instance, internet or a cable that may actually go through underwater for very long distances or maybe transmitted through space, uh, maybe from a satellite to another satellite or to Earth. And there are a lot of interferences that uh, happen in these noisy channels. Sometimes, the interferences are so powerful, like a magnetic wave, that basically the signal is changed from one to zero or zero to one, from power to non-power or off in, uh, in, in the signal. So what we need to do is to check if the message was sent correctly. And usually in this case, in Hamming distance, it's very easy, you are sending uh, two messages. You are sending the original message and the copy of itself. In other functions, you may actually send the original message and then an encoding of that message. Maybe a count of how many ones there were, maybe a XOR of the values that were uh, in the original message and so on. But this is an easier way to, to an easier Hamming distance that basically you are sending twice the same message and the receiver has to check if the two messages are identical. And the way that it checks is that this function h takes a pair s and t in the uh, Cartesian product of sn with sn and h of st is the number of positions in which s and t differ. So basically what we are expecting is that you are getting zero as the Hamming function if the two messages are identical and you're getting a different value at most n if uh, the, two the two messages differ. Uh, in case that every single bit differs, then you will get n because basically every single position in S, it was different with the corresponding element in T. And here we have uh, some examples. If H was defined for five, then the Hamming distance for uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is 5, because every 1 is changed into, one, in, into a 0. The Hamming distance between 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is 3, because the two messages differ at position 1, 3, and 5, so in three positions. And finally, the Hamming distance for another two values, sample values of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is 2 because the bits differ in uh, exactly two positions. Now, you, it doesn't matter if it's 0 or 1 in the first value and 0 and 1 in the second string. Basically, these are just examples that show you what Hamming distance does changes from 
basically it doesn't change it takes two strings and tells me in how many uh, positions the two strings differ another example of functions are boolean functions so boolean functions for instance a conjunction or a disjunction or a more complex function take uh, multiple propositional variables and it gives you gives us as a value uh, true or false and we can represent true and false as uh, one and zero so false is zero and one is uh, true and then you basically have the uh, any boolean formula is a function from uh, basically a set of pairs of n propositional variables and those propositional variables could be zero or one so basically is the cartesian product n times of the set that contains zero and one is an n place boolean function that takes n propositional variables and gives us the truth or the falseness of or basically a value in zero and one of that formula so the domain is the set of all order tuples of zero and ones we know to we have to know what zero and one one what value in that tuple corresponds to which propositional variable the codomain is the set zero one that contains zero and one basically false and true and let's assume that basically we have here p q and r and they have the possible values for the input the output for this proposed this formula and we don't write it down but basically it means uh you can actually extract it from this table as a conjunction or as a disjunction of all possible conjunctions that we we can have that is one and we can see the output in that case is basically represented here as the proposition s and here is the arrow diagram for that same logical uh, logical representation okay now i didn't represent it but i can actually show you what is the logical formula for this example so the table that you see here represents all the possible true that can be obtained from the propositions p q and r so basically what we have is that if p is true and q is true and r is true or and again for the values when we get true we have p is true and q is true and r is true and r is false sorry the negation of r or the possible case when p is true and q and r are false so p is true and not q and not r and we have one more possible case in which the output is true or p is false q is true so p and not p sorry and q and not r those are the possible cases this is basically that formula that we are interested in this case let me actually just paste it so if this is the logical formula basically what we have is this truth table and the corresponding uh, uh, arrow diagram below okay let me show you the entire screen so this is a boolean function given a logical formula it gives me for the possible inputs what is the value of the output so it takes a pair of n in the case that we have p and q and r as uh, as possible propositional variables and then uh, this uh, the set of uh, tuples of uh, length of n with values in zero and one and gives me a value in zero and one another example for instance uh, the function f is defined on uh, again 0 1 to the power 3 with values in 0 and 1 
and but is defined as x1 plus x2 plus x3 modulo 2. And then we can actually write down all the possible values. What is f of 0, 0, and 0 is basically 0 modulo 2, which is 0. f of 0, 0, and 1 is 1 modulo 2 is equal to 1, and so on. Okay. Now, let's return back to the definition of a function. So a function is said to be a function and is well defined if for every value in the domain there is there exists an exactly one value in the codomain we say that a function is not well defined in fact that is not a function if one of the possible two cases the negation of the two conjunctions that we had the conjunction of two of the constraints that we have for functions is that either we have there is no element in the codomain that satisfies f of x is equal with y for some element x in the domain or and this is inclusive or there are two different values of y that satisfies f of x is equal with y so we have f of x is equal with y1 and f of x is equal with y2 where x y1 and y2 are different for example if we want to define f defined on reals with the values in reals such that f of x is the real number y, such that x squared plus y squared is equal with 1, x is not well defined. And first of all is because you can find elements like x equal with 2, and then there is no element y such that 2 squared plus y squared, where y is in reals, not in complex numbers, such that y, uh, 2 squared plus y squared is equal with 1. Similarly, if x is equal with 0, there are actually two real numbers, y is equal with 1 and y is equal with minus 1, such that x squared plus y, uh, 0 squared plus y squared is equal with 1, because 0 squared plus 1 squared is equal with 1, and 0 squared plus minus 1 squared is equal with 1. So either one of these two tells us that this is not a function or that is a not well-defined function. It's not a function because a function must give me one and exactly one value for every x. Another example of a function that is not well-defined, or in fact that is not a function, if we want to define a function f that is defined on all uh, rational numbers, and rational numbers includes one divided by two, 2 divided by 4, uh, 3 divided by 6, and so on. All the possible rational numbers where you have a numerator and a denominator that are integers with values in integers. And we want to define it as follows. f of m divided by n is equal with m. And this is true for all integers m and n such that m divided by n is a fraction, so n is different than 0. But one thing that we can see is that 1 divided by 2 is equal with 2 divided by 4. However, f of 1 divided by 2 equal with f of one, 2 divided by 4 is not true. Because by that definition that we saw before, uh, f of 1 divided by uh, 2 is equal with 1, because it's equal with the numerator part. And f divided by 2 di uh, divided by 4 uh, is equal with 2 because it's again the numerator but 1 is different than 2. So the condition 2 that there are two different values of y such that f of x is equal with y is true. So basically it doesn't need to be that both cases like we had in the previous case of, of, of f are not satisfied. It can be that only one side one constraint is not satisfied. Now, there are also functions divided on the uh, acting on sets. So we saw one such function for the example of the power set example, where the function was defined on the power set of a set, and the corresponding values were the cardinality of that set. This is another example. F is defined on the set X with the values in Y, is a function 
And now we have A is a subset of X and C is a subset of Y. Then we can define what is the, the image of A. So F of A is the set of all the possible Y's such that Y in the codomain, such that Y is equal with F of X for some X in the set A. So these are basically the images of a function in the codomain. The reverse image or the inverse image of uh, that function for C being a subset of the codomain uh, Y is the set of all the possible elements in the domain X such that F of X is an element in C. So basically given a set in the codomain, F of minus one of that set is basically the inverse image of C's, all, all those elements in the domain whose image is in the, in the, in the subset of the codomain C. So for instance, let's consider the following function that is defined by the arrow diagram below, defined on the domain X, X equal with one, two, uh, the set that contains one, two, three, and four, and Y is the set that contains A, B, C, D, and E. And is defined by this arrow diagram below, and we see that it is indeed a function. F of one is equal with B, F of two is equal with A, F of three is equal with D, and F of four is equal with B. And we can see that for every element in the domain, we have exactly one mapping in the codomain. So now those functions that are the images and the inverse images. So for instance, F of the set that contains one, two, are the mappings, uh, one, four, are the mappings of one and four. But that's only B. So it's basically equal with the set that contains B. Similarly, the inverse image, F minus one of A, B, are those elements that are mapped into A and B. And those elements are one, two, and four. Because one maps to B, two to A, and four to B. F of A, the entire domain, so, the image of the entire domain, which before we actually saw that is also called the range of the function, is basically the set A, B, and D. Because those are the elements in the codomain, which are the mapping of at least one element in the domain. F of minus one of C and E is the inverse image of C and E. And we can see that C and E are not the mappings of any element in the domain. So it's basically empty. We have no elements in the domain that are mapped to either C or to E. Now, given that definition of functions defined, uh, functions acting on sets, then if A and B are the domain and the codomain of a function F, and F is that function, if A is a subset of X and B is a subset of X, then F applied on the union of A and B, so basically the image of uh, the union of A and B is a subset of the union between F applied on A and F applied on B. So basically the function F applied on the union of the two sets is a subset of the applied on A union the function applied on B. Now let's prove this, and we choose the method of direct proof or the element argument method in set theory that we learned last class. Suppose that Y is an element on the function of the union of A and B. So by definition of basically what is F of the union of A and B means that F that Y is equal with F of X for some X in the union of A and B. By definition of function, that basically means that, uh, by definition of union between two sets, it means that either that X belongs to A or X is a member in B. In the first case, we have that X belongs to A or in the second case that X doesn't belong to A, but that basically means that it belongs to B. If it belongs to A, that basically means that F of X is equal with Y. So Y is a member of F of A. So basically for any element in F of the union of A and B, 
is an element of f of a and by union definition is also an element in the union of f of a with any other set in particular f of b similarly if x doesn't belong to a it means that it must belong to b because it belongs to the union in which case f of x is equal with y uh, for we, which basically means that y is a member of f of b those mappings that are basically uh, for elements that belong to b and by definition of union is equal and commutativity of union it me it means that also x that y belongs to f of a union f of b because it belongs to f of b so basically f of the union of uh, uh, those two subsets of the domain below it's a subset of f of a union f of b before we go to injective functions let's see if there are any questions in the chat for the seventh slide f is defined on g3 with values in the codomain g3 does it mean that f is defined on x with values in y the way that we wrote it was that f of x is equal with y where x belongs to g3 and j uh, y also belongs to uh, j3 but the domain of x was uh, 0 1 2 yes that's true and the codomain of y uh, or the codomain of f not of y is 0 1 0 no the codomain can also be 0 1 2 but the range is 0 and 1 so basically the codomain may be bigger than the range of the function it doesn't have that all doesn't need that all values are the mapping of some element in the domain Dirac basically is asking another question for the last slide that we have showed you could you further evaluate, evaluate uh, elaborate how y exists for f of x can be used to argue that y exists for f of a or f of b so let's return back here so i guess the question is about here how do we transition that if y is a member in f of a union b why does this mean that y is equal with f of x for some x in the union of a and b and that's by definition of what f of a or f of a set means so f of a set means that is the set it's basically the equal with the set of all the values in uh, uh, the codomain such that y is equal with f of x for some x in the domain now this is a definition that defines all the elements that are mappings for some elements in a and only those elements and actually that's the important thing only those elements so there are no elements that are in this uh, constructive definition that are not that don't satisfy the condition and the condition says that there exists at least one element in a such that uh, f of x is equal with y and that's exactly what we have here so if we start from left hand side that y is a member of f of a union b means that by definition of uh, function applied on a set of values in the domain it means that y is equal with f of x for some x in a union b i hope that explains that step i am on slide 20 i think yeah got it excellent okay good so uh any more questions let me just make sure that we cover all questions okay so if there are no questions let's return back good 
So now the second subchapter that we will cover as properties of functions are the two types of uh, properties for functions. One-to-one -one functions or injective functions are those functions. So a function defined on the domain X with codomains in uh, with the codomain Y is a one-to-one -one injective function if and only if for all elements x1 belonging to the domain x and x2 belonging to the domain x if f of x1 is equal with f of x2 if the mapping or uh, through this function of x1 is equal with the mapping to this function of x2 then x1 must be equal with x2 so we have this implication by contraposition that can be also written as if x1 is different than x2, then f of x1 must be different than f of x2 for all x1 and x2 in the domain. So the first way to see injective functions is that if the mappings are the same for two elements, then those two elements must be one. If two elements, and the second way to see it as the contraposition, basically the equivalent logical formula for the same uh, defin implication above is also a universal statement that for all x1 and x2 in the domain if x1 is different than x2 then f of x1 must be different than f of x2 if you think about in injective functions or one-to-one -one functions in terms of uh, arrow diagrams it means that if x1 and x2 are two distinct elements in the domain their mappings must be also two distinct elements in the codomain. So basically, another way to see it in, uh, and this is for all elements x1 and x2. Another way to see it is that there is no element in the codomain that has more than one arrow coming into it. More than one means that it's either none or one. No more than one, okay? So, for every element that you see in the codomain, if it has uh, uh, basically zero or one incoming arrows, then it is an injective function. Now, the negation of this statement is that a function f is not a one-to-one -one or injective function if and only if the negation of the above statements are true. So the negation of that uh, universal statement is an existential statement. There exist elements x1 and x2 in the domain such that x1 is different than x2 and f of x1 is equal with f of x2. And that's exactly the negation. If you do the negation of this implication is f of x1 is equal with f of x2 and x1 is different than x2. The negation of this implication is if x, uh, x1 is different than x2 and f of x1 is equal with f of x2. So basically, in terms of arrow diagrams, if you see one element that is the mapping of more than one element from the domain, then that function is not an injective function. Okay? So now we know the definition. What does it mean to be an injective function? And do you also know uh, how to, uh, what does it mean that the function is not an injective function? Now, the question is how to prove it. And you can prove it in different ways, depending if you are looking at this as uh, an arrow diagram or if you are looking at this as a function defined from one set to another set. And then we'll use the element argument proof in order to prove, or a counter example in order to prove that uh, the function is not a one-to-one -one function. So we start with the first uh, uh, proof of one-to-one -one functions. If one-to-one -one functions are defined on finite sets, like for instance, the function f defined on the set that contains a, b, c, and d, a finite set, with values in the set that contains u, v, w, x, and y, defined by the following arrow diagram and here we have the arrow diagram we want to prove that is a one-to-one -one function so we see that for every element in a b c or d it has a mapping so this is a well-defined function 
Also, we see that for every value in the codomain, there is at most one arrow that comes into this element. So basically, even if we write down all the possible function uh, uh, values, f of a is equal with w, f of b is equal with v, f of uh, c is equal with x, and f of d is equal with y, then we can see that the following logical formula is true. For all x1 in x and all x2 in x, x1 different than x2 implies f of x1 is different than f of x2. So this function is a one-to-one -one function because this universal statement on a finite set for two variables x1 and x2 is true. This implication is always true. For any two elements that are different in the domain, their mapping is also different. So another function, g, also defined on finite sets. g is defined on the same domain and codomain that we saw before, defined by the following uh, uh, arrow diagram, well-defined function. So a has one mapping, which is w. c has one mapping, which is u. Uh, b has one mapping that is u. c has one mapping that is also w and D has one mapping that is Y, is not a one-to-one -one function because A is different than Y and G of A is equal with G of C. A, A is different than C and G of A is equal with G of C, which are both equal with uh, W. So there exist two elements, X1 in X and X2 in X, such that X1 is equal, it's different than uh, X2 and G of X1 is equal with G of X2. And that's actually, that is A and C. And A is different than C, and G of A is equal with G of C. So in the case that you want to prove that a function is not a one-to-one -one function, you give a counterexample to being a one-to-one -one function. In the case that you want to prove that it is a one-to-one -one function, you have to prove it for all elements that they are basically in the uh, domain that they are possible pairs in the domain that are different, uh, their uh, image is also different. Another example, H is defined on the set 1, 2, and 3 with values in the codomain A, B, C, and D. H of 1 is equal with C, H of 2 is equal with A, and H of 3 is equal with D. And we can see that it is a one-to-one -one function. For every value x1 and x2 in x, if x1 is different than x2, then h of x1 is different than h of x2. And you can see that for all possible pairs, 1 and 2, for instance, you get c and a. For 1 and 3, you get c and d. For 2 and 3, you get a and d. And that's all the possible pairs such that the uh, antecedent of this implication is true. Another example, k a function defined on the domain 1, 2, 3 in, with values in the codomain A, B, C, D, where K of 1 is equal with D, K of 2 is equal with B, and K of 3 is equal with D, is not a one-to-one -one function because 1 is different than 3, but K of 1 is equal with K of 3, and they are both equal with D. And we see that we actually have the statement, the logical statement of not one-to-one -one functions. There exist elements x1 and x2 in the domain such that x1 is different than x2 and k of x1 is equal with k of x2. Before we move to infinite sets, infinite sets are a little bit harder to understand because we'll have to use the method of uh, uh, proving from a particular but arbitrary chosen element, the element argument uh, proof. Let's see if there are any questions in the chat. You can take one minute break and ask any questions in the chat and I will respond after one minute break. We'll need basically a short break after almost an hour and a half. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, sure. For the finite set, uh, mm, to prove it's one to one other than showing uh, other cases, are there any other ways to show that's one to one? Exactly the same way that we'll see for infinite sets. 
basically suppose that x1 and x2 are elements of the set with f of x1 is equal with f of x2 and then show that it must follow up that x1 is equal with x2 and okay. similarly for not one to one we'll basically have to find a counter example so we'll see that this is a function defined on infinite domains and we can have uh, basically we assume that f of x1 is equal with f of x2 and those two are equal only if the two equations are equal and then you basically can add one to both sides of that equation uh, then divide by four and it must be the case that those two f of x1 is equal with f of x2 if and only if x1 is equal with x2 so the same We'll use a general proof for infinite sets, but of course it applies for finite sets. Good. Okay, so Alisa will respond to your question in, in basically one minute. Let's take a short break for, and other people can actually post questions and we'll respond to these questions after a very short break. Let's take a one minute break. Let me post it. So we'll take a break. Okay. Hi, everyone. So um, Alisa is asking a question. For slide 24, we are given that H1 is C, H2 is A, and H3 is D. Slide 24 h and it is a one-to-one -one function and one-to-one -one, probably this is what the question is it's given so this is given the values for h are given and the question is is it a one-to-one -one function so the function is given we'll have to Basically, like in the previous case, we were given an arrow diagram definition of the function. In this case, we are given uh, the function as an enumeration of what is the value of the function for every element in the domain. So basically, what is h, what is h of 1, what is h of 2, what is h of 3, and those are all the elements in the finite domain. Okay, good. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's move to one-to-one -one functions on infinite sets, on domains that are infinite. So we say again that a function is a one-to-one -one function if and only if for all x1 and x2 in the domain, if f of x1 is equal with f of x2, then x1 is equal with x2. And there is the other definition that basically says that the function is one to one if for all elements x1 and x2 in the domain if x1 is different than x2 then f of x1 must be different than f of x2 to show that this function is a one to one function we will generally use a method of direct proof or if you think of the function as uh, the set representation of that function is the element argument proof suppose that x1 and x2 are elements of x such that f of x1 is equal with f of x2 so exactly the step of the method of direct proof for a universal implication suppose that for this for two random arbitrary elements the premise is true f uh, x1 and x2 are two elements such that f of x1 is equal with f of x2 then using arithmetics or basically the definition of those functions show that x1 is the, it's equal with x2. There cannot be, cannot be any other case that makes uh, f of x1 equal with f of x2. To show that a function is not one-to-one, -one, then we will try to use the method of direct proof and detect that we cannot or similarly we give a counter example that uh, we basically find two elements x1 and x2 in the domain such that f of x1 is equal with f of x2 but x1 is different than x2 
And we'll give examples for both. We'll give examples that are one-to-one -one functions, and we prove it with a method of direct proof. And we give examples of functions that are not one-to-one -one functions, and we will use a counterexample or a constructive method to actually find such two elements for which f of x1 is equal with f of x2, but x1 is different than x2. And these methods, although they are defined for infinite sets, can be also taken on finite sets, okay? Uh, and again, the counterexample doesn't have to be one counterexample. It can be a way to build a counterexample. Like, for instance, consider f of x is equal with x square for any x in reals. Just seeing that x square is equal with uh, a y, and now basically for two different x's, we get the same y, like minus 1 and 1, both of them square is equal with 1. But you don't have to actually uh, 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 give that counterexample. Just by giving that any uh, value and it's negative in square is equal with the same value is enough. It's kind of like a counterexample, but it's um, the method of building a, a counterexample. So let's actually do examples of one-to-one -one functions proving that the uh, uh, function is one-to-one -one or proving that the function is not one-to-one. -one. So we'll start first with the function f defined from reals to reals. These are infinite sets such that f of x is equal with 4x minus 1 for all x in reals. Is f a one-to-one -one function? By definition, f is a one-to-one -one function if and only if for all x1 and x2 in uh, the domain, if f of x1 is equal with f of x2, then x1 is equal with x2. By method of direct proof, suppose that x1 and x2 are any real numbers such that 4 of x, uh, 4 multiplied with x1 minus 1 is equal with 4 multiplied with x2 minus 1. So suppose that x1 and x2 are any real numbers, such that f of x1 is equal with f of x2. You can add in this equation 1 to both sides, and then you'll get 4 of x1, 4 multiplied with x1 is equal with 4 multiplied with x2. Again, you can divide by 4, both sides, and you get that x1 is equal with x2. And the answer is yes, that for any two arbitrary chosen elements, such that f of x1 is equal with f of x2, x1 must be equal with x2. So this function is a one-to-one -one function. Another example is the function g. g is defined on uh, integers with values in integers. g of n is equal with n squared for any n in, in integers. And again, the same question. Is g a one-to-one -one function? How do you prove for functions that are not one-to-one -one functions? You prove them in the same way. Start by trying to prove it. So start by trying to show that g is a one-to-one -one function. So suppose that n1 and n2 are two integers such that f of n1, uh, g of n1 is equal with g of n2. That basically means that n1 squared is equal with n2 squared. And from that, try to show that n1 is equal with n2. However, immediately we can see a counterexample that is not true for all integers that n1 square is equal with n2 square implies that n1 is equal with n2. For instance, 1 square is equal with minus 1 square. They are both equal with 1. You don't need more counterexamples than that, but you can actually see that for every n and minus n, their squares is equal with n square. So uh, if n is a positive uh, integer. So g, uh, with one counterexample, we can basically already see that g is not a one-to-one -one function. So the method of proof in both cases starts by trying to prove it and then deriving, uh, if you can, that the two numbers are equal or the two values are equal or not. And in that case, you have the counterexample that is not a one-to-one -one function. 
Let me give you a computer science uh, related function, which is not a one-to-one -one function. So hash functions are functions defined from a larger set to a smaller set used in signing documents. So the truth is that you cannot sign, let's say that you have a document of a legal document of uh, uh, 10 pages and you provide a signature for that legal document. The signature doesn't represent the document. It's just the fact that you uh, signed with a small image or a small string uh, that document, okay? It's, it's used in uh, a lot of uh, uh, computer science techniques in sending messages through uh, a network, again, a noisy network and providing a a value that can be checked and gives you some security that the message was sent correctly because the hash signature is the same. The example is quite simple. Consider that we have hash defined from the set of all social security numbers, ignoring hyphens, and these are uh, the set SSN. And the codomain is the set that contains the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The hash of every of any uh, social security number n is n modulo 7. So basically it's the remainder after division of with 7 for all social security numbers n. For instance, the hash uh, signature of this social security number is five. However, hash functions are not one-to-one. -one. So the hash function for another uh, social security number is also equal with five. And in fact, you can find several such thousands of such uh, social security numbers that will give you the same uh, uh, hash value, basically the same remainder after division with seven. In hash functions, these are called collisions. And there are some small methodologies which basically gives you a different hash value, but again, for a very finite number of elements. So if you have uh, uh, n locations or basically some re restricted number of locations, and you want to uh, map every uh, social security number to one location, one possible collision resolution method is that instead, if the current position in that array or location is already occupied, then linearly search for the next position that is empty. Now, again, this will not eliminate collisions. Collisions are when the hash function value is the same and you have two different elements that are mapped to the same value in the codomain. Before we continue with onto functions, let's see if there are any questions. So just to recap, one-to-one -one functions are those functions that for any two elements, in the domain uh, that are different, their uh, mappings through that function must also be different. And this is for any two elements in the domain, okay? And since there are no questions, let's return back to the properties of functions. And the next property that we will talk about is the onto property. A function f defined to in the, on the domain x with values in the codomain y, is called an onto or subjective function if and only if for all y in the codomain there exists an x in the domain such that f of x is equal with y. So basically every element in the codomain is the mapping of at least one element from the domain. For arrow diagrams you can think of onto functions as those functions where every, each element of the codomain uh, set has at least one arrow pointing to it from such from some elements in the domain. Now, a function is uh, f defined on x with values in y is a not 
uh, onto or not subjective function if and only if there exists an element in the codomain such that for all the elements in the domain x f of x is different than y so you can think of basically there is some element in y that is not the image of any element in x or in the arrow diagrams that the function is not an onto function if you find one element in the codomain which doesn't have an arrow pointing into it this is a different property than one to one so one to one was just that you for any two elements in the domain their mappings must be different uh, for any two elements different in the domain their mappings must be also different and this is for all the elements in the domain the onto property is that for any element in the codomain there is at least one element in the domain that is uh, mapped into that element in the codomain so all the elements in the codomain are mappings of some elements in the domain so with arrow so the the way that we defined onto a uh, one-to-one -one property first we defined it with arrow diagrams then we defined it with four finite sets then we defined it for the general infinite sets as the domain we do exactly the same for onto functions so a function is onto with arrow diagrams if if you look at the elements in the codomain all of the elements in the codomain are the mappings of at least one uh, element in the domain so for instance you can for every element in the codomain let's choose uh, uh, an arbitrary chosen but particular element y we can find at least one element in the domain like x such that y is the mapping f of x so f of x is equal with y and this happens for each element in y in the codomain okay so let's see an example for instance, g is a function defined on the domain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 with values in the codomain a, b, c, and d. And we can see that g of 1 is equal with b, g of 2 is equal with c, g of 3 is equal with a, g of 4 is equal with uh, c, and g of 5 is equal with d because we have these outgoing arrows. This is a well-defined function for every element in the domain there is exactly one mapping in the codomain. It's not an one-to-one -one function because we see that two and four are both mapped to C, but it is an onto function. Every element in the codomain is the mapping of at least one element in the domain. So this, prop this formula, this logical formula is true. For every Y in, X, in Y, there exists an X in X such that G of X is equal with Y. And this universal existential statement can be proven using a conjunction of all the possible y's. So for y equal a, there exists a 3 in x such that g of 3 is equal with a. And for y equal b, uh, there exists 1 in the domain such that g of 1 is equal with b. And for y equal c, we have 2 such that uh, in x such that g of 2 is equal with c and for y equal d we have 5 in x such that uh, g of 5 is equal with d so this universal existential statement is true for every element in the codomain there exists at least one element in the domain such that g of x is equal with y now this is an example of not an onto function so how do you show that a function is not onto? That you find at least one element in the codomain such that there exists no x in the domain such that f of x is equal with y. And here we have an example. Again, it's a function defined on the set that contains the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 with, the, with values in the codomain A, uh, the set that contains A, B, C, and D. However, we can see that B is not the image of any uh, element in the domain. So F is not onto because uh, B, 
is different than uh, f of x for any x in uh, uh, the domain. So in, in, in fact, we can actually rewrite it as there exists a y in the codomain such that for all x in the domain, f of x is different than y. So it's exactly the negation of onto. It's true. Now again, we can define a function through an enumeration of all possible uh, mappings. So H is defined on the set that contains 1, 2, 3, and 4, with values in the codomain that contains, is the set that contains A, B, and C, such that H of 1 is equal with C, H of 2 is equal with A, H of 3 is equal with C, and H of 4 is equal with B. H is onto, because again, the formula is true for all elements y in the codomain y, there exists an x in the domain x, such that h of x is equal with y. In fact, the conjunction a is equal with uh, uh, h of 2, and b is equal with h of 4, and c is equal with h of 1 is true. Another example, the function k defined on the set that contains 1, 2, 3, and 4 with values in the codomain, uh, the set that contains a, b, and c, such that uh, k of 1 is equal with c, k of 2 is equal with b, k of 3 is equal with b, and k of 4 is equal with c, is not onto because for a in the uh, codomain, there is no x in one, two, in the set that contains one, two, three, and four in the domain such that A would be equal with uh, K of X. So A is different than K of X for any X in the set one, two, three, and four. So K is not on toe, and you can draw the arrow diagram for it, but it is, uh, uh, but H is on toe. Now, how do we prove that onto that functions are onto on infinite sets. So again, first we start from the definition. What does it, what does it mean that the function is onto? It means that it's uh, a function is onto if and only if for all y in the codomain y and there exists an x in the domain x such that f of x is equal with y. So we prove that the function is onto by using the method of generalizing from a generic particular. Suppose that y is an element in the domain, in the codomain y, and show that there must be, exist an element x in the domain x, such, such that f of x is equal with y. The same, you start the same way to prove if uh, for a function that is not onto, but you will find that there exists an element in the codomain such that that element is not equal with any f of x for any x in uh, the domain x. So let's start with a couple of examples. So we are given the function f defined on reals with values in reals, and we want to prove that the function uh, is either onto or uh, basically that... Um, uh, or is not onto by given counter example. So as we can see here, basically f of x is equal with uh, uh, 4x minus 1 for all x in reals. We start with suppose x is an element in reals arbitrarily chosen. Show that there ex must exist an x such that y is equal with 4x minus 1 y is equal with 4x minus 1, uh, we can subtract 1, uh, we can add 1 on both sides, and then divide by 4. So now basically we'll get 4x is equal with y plus 1, and dividing by 4 we get x is equal with y plus 1 divided by 4. But y plus 1 divided by 4 is a real, because y plus 1 will be uh, a, 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 an integer, Divided by 4 is a rational number, and rational numbers are included in reals. So for any y, we can find the corresponding x such that f of x is equal with y. Therefore, f is an onto function. So again, the element argument, kind of the element argument proof, 
tells us that choose a Y, arbitrary chosen in the codomain, and show that there must exist at least one X, in this case exactly one, such that uh, Y is basically equal, uh, F of Y is equal with F of X. Another example, H, is a function defined on integers with values in integers. And again, if we want to prove that is onto, h of n is equal with 4n minus 1 for all integers. Again, try to prove it and start with uh, such an example. But this is exactly the same function as above with the difference that is not defined only on integers, it is defined on all real numbers. So h of n is is uh, equal with 4n minus 1 for uh, 0 in integers. h of n is equal with 0. Is, uh, can be solved only if 4n minus 1 is equal with 0. That is if and only if n is equal with 1 divided by 4. However, 1 divided by 4 is not an integer. So although h is defined from integers to integers, uh, not all integers in the codomain can be mappings of elements in the domain. So uh, for zero in the codomain, we cannot find an element in the domain. One over four is not an integer. Therefore, h of n is different than zero for any integer n, and h is not an onto function. Before we move to exponential functions and logarithmic functions, let's see if there are any questions. Okay. Okay. So there are no questions. We'll basically move on to logarithmic functions and exponential functions. So most of you already know what an exponential function is, like logarithmic functions from high school, but I will cover them in this class to be self-contained. Basically, everything that is defined in this class has to be defined in this class, okay? So the exponential function in a base B, exponential in base B defined on reals with values in positive uh, reals, is basically the base b to the power x for any x in reals. So for instance, exponential function of zero is b to the power zero and b to the power zero is equal with one, no matter what the base is. Similarly, exponential in base b of minus x is b to the power minus x, which is equal with one divided by b to the power x. And you can see that no matter what the input is as a real, the output is a positive real number. So that's why the codomain can be restricted on positive reals because the output is always positive for real numbers. The exponent function is a one-to-one -one function and an onto function, okay? For any positive real b different than one, we basically have b to the power v is equal with b to the power u. It implies u is equal with v, okay? So if the mappings are the same, then the elements in the domain must be the same, which is basically what uh, one to one means. Onto, it basically is that for any uh, value in the codomain, we can find an element in the domain such that is uh, that mapping is the mapping of the element in the domain. I will not show you that, that proof, uh, but we will show you the laws of exponents. For any uh, two bases, B and C, in positive uh, reals, and any U and V in reals, B to the power U multiplied with B to the power V is equal with B to the power U plus V is the classic uh, uh, multiplication of powers is the base to the sum of the two powers. B to the power U, everything to the power V is B to the power U multiplied with V. 
Also, b to the power u divided by b to the power v is equal with b to the power u minus v. And this can actually obtain, be obtained from exponent of a negative number because b to the power u divided by b to the power v is b to the power u multiplied with b to the power minus v, which brings us to the multiplication of powers, and that is the sum. So in this case, will be b to the power u minus v. b multiplied with c to the power u is equal with b to the power u multiplied with c to the power u. And this can actually be proved if you consider induction uh basically it can be proved that no matter what u is as an integer you can uh, positive integer you can prove it through induction it's true in the base case and then it's true for any k it implies that it's true for k plus one however in this case we are talking about real numbers so this is given as a law of exponents the logarithmic function is also defined uh, on positive reals with values in reals. And we defined it a little bit before. Logarithmic base b of x is equal with y if and only if b to the power y is equal with x. Also, the logarithmic function is one-to-one -one and onto function. Basically, for any real number, b different than one, logarithmic base b of u is equal with logarithmic base b of v, implies that u is equal with v for all u and v in positive real numbers. And again, we have the properties of logarithms, like we had the properties of uh, exponents. For all b, c, x in positive reals, with b different than 1 and c different than 1, logarithm in base b of x multiplied with uh, y is equal with logarithm in base b of x plus logarithm in base b of y. So the logarithm of a product is the sum of the logarithms of the two operands of that product. The logarithm of, div uh, of a division, logarithm in base b of x divided by y is logarithm in base b of x minus logarithm in base b of y. Logarithm in base b of x to the power a is equal with a multiplied with logarithm in base b of x. Logarithm in base c of x is logarithm in base b of x divided by logarithm in base b of c. So, for instance, if you have a calculator that can compute logarithm in base 2, you can still compute by using a division logarithm in base or in any base c of x by computing logarithm in base 2 of x and dividing it with the result of logarithm in base 2 of uh, c. So now, given those laws of exponents and laws of uh, logarithms and the definitions of logarithms and exponents, we can prove any uh, the following statements. For all b, c, and x in positive real numbers, with b different than 1 and c different than 1, logarithm in base c of x is equal with logarithm in base b of x divided by logarithm in base b of c. So how do we prove this? Again, we are going to prove it using the uh, method of direct proof. Suppose any positive real numbers b, c, and x are given, arbitrarily chosen such that u is equal with logarithm in base uh, b of c, v is the result of logarithm in base c of x, and w is equal with the logarithm in base b of x. So basically, you are giving uh, three real numbers, and by definition of logarithm, there exist u, v, and w that are the results of these logarithms. By the definition of logarithm, we'll basically get logarithm in base b of c is equal with u if c is equal with b to the power u. Similarly, logarithm in base c of x is equal with v if x is equal with c to the power v. And logarithm in base b of c of x is equal with w if uh, x is equal with b to the power b, uh, b to the power w. Now, we can see by laws of exponents 
that c to the power v, which was equal with uh, x, is also equal with b to the power w. However, by laws of exponents, b to the power u was c, and now to the power v is x. So x is c to the power v, but c was b to the power u, which is b to the power uh, b, uh, everything to the power v. So it's equal with b to the power u mul multiplied with v. But x was both equal with b to the power w and b to the power u and uh, multiply with v. So by the fact that uh, exponent function is a one to one function, it must be the case that u multiply with v is equal with w. But by uh, it basically follows from all of this that logarithmic base c of uh, b of c multiplied with logarithmic base c of x is equal with logarithmic base b of x by dividing both sides with logarithmic base b of c we'll basically get the logarithmic base c of x is equal with logarithmic base b of x divided by logarithmic base b of c so we started with any three numbers b c and x in positive reals with b1 and c1 dif uh, c uh, b and c different than 1 and we basically by definition of logarithm we know of the existence of u v and w f as the results of those leg logarithms by definitions we also basically get that uh, what are the exponents c is b to the power u x is c to the power v and x is uh, b to the power w and then by laws of exponents and the fact that uh, exponent functions are one to one we basically got the formulas that we wanted to get okay any questions these kind of proofs are very important so if you have any questions please unmute yourselves and i will basically respond to them So really, the way that you should see this is that uh, basically u exists, and actually let me write it in this way, it's much easier, basically, that there is a u that is the result of logarithmic base b of c, there is a v that is the result of logarithmic base c of x, this was v, and there is a w that is the result of logarithmic base b of x. And then we use the definition of logarithm to obtain that basically what C, X, and X are. Then from the fact that X is equal with uh, X, we got that C to the power V is equal with B to the power W. But we replaced C with B to the power U. So we got that B to the power U multiplied with V is equal with B to the power W. By the fact that one to uh, that uh, exponent functions are one to one functions we get uh, that uv is equal with uh, w so this is by one to one exponent and then we replaced what is the meaning of u v and w and we basically got this the value that the equation that we wanted okay so let's see if there are any questions in the chat none Good. now there are some common notations in computer science uh, which are for logarithm base 10 they are called lo uh, common logarithms and you will see them in many uh, programming languages as that just log uh, logarithm in base E are called natural logarithms and they are uh, denoted by ln, logarithm in natural base. But again, no matter what base you want to compute in, for instance, you want to compute logarithm base 2 of 5, even if you don't have it available in that programming language, you can write it as logarithm in base 10 of 5 divided by logarithm in base 10 of 2. 
or natural logarithm of 5 divided by natural logarithm of 2. One-to-one -one correspondences. So if a function is both a one-to-one -one function and an onto function, then we call that function a one-to-one -one correspondence or a bijection function. And here is a simple example for finite domains. So if every element in the domain has a mapping in the codomain and uh, uh, those mappings are different and all of the elements in the codomain are mapped, are the mapping of an element from the domain, that is a one-to-one -one correspondence. You can now see that for uh, finite domains, the codomain of a one-to-one -one correspondence has to have, has to be finite and has to have exactly the same number of elements as you had in the domain because only then you can have a one-to-one -one correspondence, that every element in the domain is mapped to a different value in the codomain, and therefore the same number of elements that we have in the domain, we have in the codomain. Let me give you an example. Consider the function from the power set of a set AB to a set of strings, and these strings are zero, zero, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And we define it as follows. If A is in the uh, input uh, set, basically in the subset of the power set, and we call that subset uppercase A, write 1 in the first position of the string of this H of A. So H of A has two characters. It's a string. And if lowercase a was in the input, then write one in, as the first uh, position of the string in the output, or write zero otherwise. If a is not in uh, input a, then write a zero in the first position of the string h of a. If b is in the input set a, then write one in the second position of the uh, string h of a. And if B is not in uh, input A, then write a zero in the second position of the string H of A. So the possible subsets of A, B are empty set, the set contains A, the set contains B, and the set contains A, B. The status of A in the first case is not in the empty set, and so is not B in the empty set in the status of B. Therefore, the output is zero, zero. Basically, neither A nor B is in the input. And similarly, for the input being the set that contains A, A is in, so we have basically uh, 1 as the, the string in the output, and B is not in, so we have 0 as the second character. So the, the mapping of the set that contains A is 1, 0. In a similar way, the mapping for B is 0, 1, and the mapping of A, B is 1, 1. And here we have the arrow diagram. We can see that this function is a 1 to 1 correspondence because, first of all, it's a 1 to 1 uh, mapping and it is an onto mapping. So this is the finite set, okay? This kind of function, like this one that you see here, is called a bitmap. Basically, you have a bit in the output string that corresponds for the existence or not of every element in the input, input set. So the output is really a bitmap, a mapping that tells you that if the element is there or not. Next. Now, for infinite sets, for instance, we have the function defined on the Cartesian product of reals with reals with values in reals and reals. f of x, y is equal with the pair x plus y and x minus y for all x, y in the Cartesian product of reals with reals. Proof that the function is one-to-one -one correspondence has two parts. 
first of all, that is a one-to-one -one function, and then that is an onto function. So we'll start with one-to-one -one function. So the proof that is a one-to-one -one function, suppose that x1, y1, and x2, y2 are two ordered pairs in the domain R Cartesian product with R, such that f of x1, y1 is equal with f of x2, y2. f of x1, y1 is the pair f, uh, x1 plus x, uh, y1 and x1 minus y1. And that is equal with the tuple x2 plus y2 and x2 minus y2. And that's a tuple. We, we learned about tuple equality when we talked about sets. Two tuples are equal if the corresponding arguments are equal. So this tuple is equal with this tuple if x1 plus y1 is equal with x2 plus y2 and x1 minus y1 is equal with x2 minus y2. So we have the two equations. We can add the two equations on both sides. So in that case, 2x1 is equal with 2x2 because y1 minus y2, y1 is 0 and y2 minus y2 is 0. So we get that x1 is equal with x2. Now, if we substitute in the first equation x1 with x2, we get x2 plus y1 is equal with x2 plus y2. We can subtract both parts with uh, x1 or x2, depending which one we substitute it. And now we are basically getting that x2 is equal with x, uh, x1. And let me actually write it down. So this is 2, exactly as we did the substitution. This is 2. And now we, sub we subtract on both sides x2, and we get y1 is equal with y2, which basically means that if f of x1, x, uh, y1 is equal with f of x2, y2, it implies that the tuple x1, y1 is equal with the tuple x2, y2. Because from this equation, we got both that x1 is equal with y, uh, x2 and that y1 is equal with y2. So the function is a one-to-one -one function for every pair such that the mappings are equal the pairs must also be equal. Second part of the proof, prove that the function is onto, and then it proves that is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So we have two parts. The first part was that it's a part one that is a one-to-one -one function, and part two is that is an onto function. So the proof for onto function. Suppose that the function is onto, by definition of onto, let uv be any ordered pair in uh, the Cartesian product of reals with reals, which is the codomain of that function f. Suppose that we found rs in reals with reals, such that f of rs is equal with uh, the pair uv. By definition of the function f, r, uh, r plus s and r minus s is equal with uv. Now we want to uh, the two tuples are equal if r plus s is equal with u and r minus s is equal with v. We can add the two equations and we get that 2r is equal with u plus v. And we can subtract the two equations and we get, uh, uh, we can subtract from this the first equation the second one and we get that 2s is equal with u minus v we can add the two uh, equations uh, actually we can di divide by two and we get that r is equal with u plus v divided by two and s is u minus v divided by two so for any two real numbers u and v we can find also two real numbers because these are rational numbers Therefore, there are also real numbers. Uh, actually, they are real numbers because u and v are real. So 
we can just find two other real numbers, r and s, such that f of rs is equal with u, uh, the tuple uv. Therefore, f is onto, because for any element in the codomain, we can find a correspond an element in the domain that is the map uh, mapped into that element in the codomain. Since we proved both that the function is one-to-one -one and that is onto, it follows up that the function is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. Any questions? 43. The second line. Okay. So uh, do you mean suppose that we found R and S? of the proof or let so the second line of the proof is that so we chose we we chose an arbitrary chosen u and v but now we have to show that this u and v is the mapping of some pair in the domain so is not maybe in my language here was not quite uh, correct suppose that we found if we prove that there is an R and S as a tuple and F of R S is equal with U V, then we basically show that there exists. Uh, so suppose is just a supposition which is not proven in this case yet. We had to prove it by basically using the formula for F and extracting what R and S are. But we had to choose, we had to start from something. So it's Maybe a little bit confusing that suppose that we found them, but really the meaning is that in order to find them, you have to consider that uh, uh, what's the definition of F. So it's the best way that we can define here that we can actually use the definition of F to find RNS. Ah, 2R plus V, okay. So where did we get this? We summed up the two equations. If you sum two equations on both sides, the, you obtain also an equation. So R plus S is equal with U. R minus S is equal with V. If you sum them on the left hand side, you get 2R plus S minus S. Plus S minus S is zero. And on the right hand side, you get U plus V. So if you sum the two equations, you get 2R uh, is equal with u plus v. If you subtract the two equations, you, you uh, so r plus s minus r minus s is basically r minus r plus uh, 2s is 2s. And on the other side, you get u minus s. So basically, you get this by summing the two equations by sum of and you get the second one by this first equation equations by summing and computing the difference of the two equations you get two new equations because what we want is to find the r and to find the s so we have to isolate from these two equations R on one side and no S and S on one side and no R. So basically they are all functions of the inputs U and V. Okay. Let's see. Okay, excellent. So Scott is asking after the step that you perform elimination to get R and S, could you also do change of variable to prove this? I don't know, Scott, what do you mean by change of variable in this case? We define change of variable in, uh, uh, in sequences in order to, to change from one range to another range for the indices. But in this case, what do you mean? Um, I mean, uh, if you say um, let u be r, let b, uh, v be the new s, and then let r be just 
swap what the actual symbols are. Can you do that? Yes, yes. Uh, but in this case, we uh, okay. I understand. So, like we did here, let U V be any uh, order pair in R S, and here we can say let uh, R be the name of U plus V divided by two, and S u minus v divided by 2 and then f of r s must be equal with u v as a pair so but so so i do understand basically your your point is that we could have started with this is r and this is s and there uh, and if you apply f on those r and s you get exactly u v but the truth is that i couldn't guess them uh, these are not easy to guess by just looking at the function definition so I basically started with let R and S be such a pair whose mapping is U, V, and then I computed what R and S must have been such that their mapping is U, V. So I think I understand what you're saying, that basically I could have assumed or change of variable uh, uh, ch to get the pair that whose mapping, uh, the pair in the input whose mapping is the pair in the output. But this is the way that it's easier to actually compute what is that pair instead of guessing it, because we don't want to guess it. So I, I think we are both on the same, uh, same idea. It's just that I'm doing a constructive way to, to find it instead of just guessing it. Okay. There's so so. There's no problems with the other way, though. No, no. If you guess them and you guess them correctly, that's great. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Okay. Great. Okay. So before we move on to inverse functions, let's see if there are more questions. No. Good. So let's talk about inverse functions. For functions that are one-to-one -one correspondences, and this is very important, if f is a function defined on x with values in y, and it is a one-to-one -one correspondence, then and only then there exists an inverse function for f. f of minus 1 that is defined on y with values in x, such that for any element in the domain of the inverse function y, f of minus 1 of y is that unique element x in the domain such that f of x is equal with y. So really, f of minus 1 of y for any y in the codomain is equal with x if and only if y is equal with f of x or f of x is equal with y. Okay. Let me actually write it that way because that's the way that we defined it above if and only if f of x is equal with y. Excellent. So, and it's important that these are one-to-one -one correspondences because only then you can say that every element in the codomain has a mapping and in fact, a unique mapping. So by the fact that it is onto, it has a mapping and by the fact that it is a one-to-one, -one, uh, function it's the unique mapping of one element in the domain only then the f of minus one is a function okay so let's see some examples for instance we have the function that took us from power sets to uh, the signatures of those power sets as a string h so h was basically a one-to-one -one correspondence that for any subset of a and b we had one string representation a bitmap if a was a member of that subset and if b is a member of that subset giving us a zero and ones the positions of the strings the inverse function for h is h minus one h minus one will basically map strings zero zero one zero 0, 1, and 1, 1 to the corresponding sets. If 0 is the, uh, in, uh, the first position, 
then A doesn't belong to the output. If one is the first position, uh, then A belongs to the output. If zero is the first, the second position, then B doesn't belong to the output. If one is the second position, then B belongs to the output. So here is the definition as an arrow diagram. And here is the definition as enumeration of all the finite values. H of minus one of zero, zero is uh, the empty set. H of minus one of uh, one, zero is A. H of minus one of zero, one is B. And H of minus one of one, one is AB. Next, let's assume that we have the function f defined on reals with values in reals such that f of x is equal with 4x minus 1 for all the real numbers x. The inverse function for f is f of minus 1 defined on reals to reals such that for every particular but arbitrary chosen element y in the codomain of the original function but the domain in the second function the inverse function f of minus one of y is that unique element x such that f of x is equal with y f of x is equal with y if uh, 4x minus one is equal with y we can add one and divide by four and we get x is equal with y plus one divided by four which is a real number so for every y in reals, we can find y plus 1 divided by 4 in uh, the original function such that f of y plus 1 divided by 4 is equal with uh, uh, y. And basically we get f of minus 1 of y is for uh, y plus 1 divided by 4. Is that element that from the domain such that f of that element is equal with y. So you see, when you want to compute the inverse function, you basically assume that x exists, and then you basically get f of x is equal with y, and you have to simplify to get a value for y and for x from that, and that basically gives you the function f of minus 1. If a and b are sets, and f is a, a, a defined uh, if x and y are sets and f is defined on x with values in y is a one to one and an onto function then f of minus one divide, uh, defined on y with values in x is also a one to one and onto function first of all we know that it exists but what we are proving new here is that is also one to one correspondence function and before we prove it Let's see if there are any questions. So Scott, uh, basically you are right that we basically can get R and S. We already discussed about that. That was the last question. Okay. So let's take uh, again one minute break and then we'll continue with these inverse functions. I just want to give opportunity to everyone to respond to question, to ask questions. So let's take one minute break, ask any questions again. So one minute break. Okay, hi everyone. So we'll basically get back to the lecture. Okay. Good. Oops. Okay, so if X and Y are two sets, and f is a one-to-one -one and an onto function. First of all, we know that by definition, there is a, an inverse function, f of minus one, defined on y with values in x. This theorem says that this function is also one-to-one -one function and onto function. Now, this part, the proof is uh, the, the two proofs that f of minus one is a one-to-one -one function and that f of minus one is an onto function. So let's make sure that everything is working properly. Yes, good. So f of minus one is a one-to-one -one function if and only if there are uh, uh, for any, suppose for any y1 and y2 elements on, in its domain, 
f of minus 1 of y1 is equal with f of minus 1 of y2. Now, if x was f of minus 1 of uh, y1 and also f of minus 1 of y2, such that that x belongs to uh, the domain. So basically, this is a function and it must be equal uh, with some x in the domain of the original function f. By definition of f of minus 1, it means that f of x is equal with y1. And also, by definition of uh, f of minus 1, f of uh, x is equal with y2. Now, from the fact that uh, the function f was uh, a one-to-one -one, uh, function, it follows that y1 must be equal with y2. Only then f of x is equal with y1 and f of x is equal with y2 when basically y1 is equal with y2. f of minus 1 is onto. Suppose that there is an x in the codomain of f of minus 1, which is actually x, the domain of f. Let y be uh, the result of f of x, and this y is a member of y. By definition of f of minus 1, again, we get that f of minus 1 of y must be equal with that x. So for any x, we can find a y such that f of minus y, uh, 1 of y is equal with x. So the function f of minus 1 is also onto. So we prove that is both one to one, and that is onto. Okay. For finite sets, the two sets for uh, uh, inverse functions must have the same number of elements. Suppose that f is a function from f to y, and f is uh, a one to one function. That is, if and only if f is an onto function. So now there are two directions. Basically, if f, if x was a set from x1 to xm, and y was a set of y1 to ym with the same number of elements, f is a one-to-one -one function, implies f is an onto function. We start with the definition of one-to-one -one function. First of all, from the definition of one to one, it means that f of x1, f of x2, up to f of xm are all distinct elements. S is the set of all the y's such that for every x in the domain, f of x is different than y. f of x1 as a set, f of x2 as a set, up to f of xm as a set, and s are mutually disjoint. By the size, by the cardinality of y, we get that the cardinality of y is m. However, the cardinality of f of x1, the cardinality of f of x2, and so on, since these are all elements in the original y, including the set of elements that is not in uh, f of x1, f of x2, up to f of x n, is m plus the cardinality of s we get that m is equal with m plus the cardinality of s, which means that the cardinality of s is equal with zero if we subtract m on both sides of that equation, which means that there are no elements of y that are not the images of other elements of x. Therefore, f must be onto. So from f being a one-to-one, -one, it follows that m is onto. The second part of this proof, we have to prove that if f, if, if f is onto, then f is one-to-one -one function. Again, we do it by cardinality, cardinality of the function. First of all, the cardinality of every f of minus one of y of uh, i is greater than or equal with one. That's the definition of onto. Basically, for every element in the codomain, there is an inverse, there is a mapping. There is an element in the domain whose mapping was the element in the codomain. Again, m would be equal with the cardinality of x, which is the cardinality of uh, every one of the uh, elements, the inverse mappings, which are in in total m elements. 
each one of the elements must if one of these elements operands of the summation must be greater than or equal with one there are m elements but the sum is strictly equal with m which means that the cardinality of each one of them is equal with one therefore the function is a one-to-one -one function so if it's an onto function it must be one-to-one -one function okay the final topic that we will cover today uh, sub chapter 7.3 in our textbook is composition of functions if f is a function defined from x to the codomain y prime and g is a function defined from y to the codomain z with the property that the range of f is a subset of the domain of g so basically y prime is a subset of y then the composition of f and g is a function g composed with f defined on x with values in z such that g composed with f of x is g of f of x so basically f will take us from x to some y and g of y will take us to a value in z so here we see x takes us to f of y to f of x and then g of f of x or g composed with f of x will take us from f of x to some uh, z in the codomain of g okay so here are some examples if f is defined from integers to integers and so is g f of n is n plus one and g of n is n square then g composed with f of n is g of f of n g of f of n will f of n is n plus one so g of n plus one if we replace the value in n in g with n plus one is n plus one square now we can see that f composed with g is also defined is f of g of n g of n is n square so is equal with f of n square which is equal with if we replace n in with n square in f of n is n square plus one now one thing that we can see is that g composed with f is different than f composed with g because if you apply it on one both of them g composed with f of one is n plus one square which is two square which is equal with four but f composed with g of one is one square plus one which is one plus one which is equal with two so f composed with g is not equal with g composed with f so composition is not commutative so here we have more examples this is an example with arrow diagrams f is a function that takes us from x to y where x is one two three and y is a b c d then g is a function that takes us from y to z where z is uh, x y z and now we can compute g composed with f or g of f of, of x one goes to c c goes to uh, z so one goes to z two goes to b and b goes to y so two goes to y and three goes to a which goes to y which 3 goes to y2. So G composed with F is the arrow diagram that we have on the bottom. Another example of composition of functions, basically here is, we can see that we are given this function F and we are given the identity function. I of X uh, defined on X with values in X is the identity function where I of X is equal with X and f composed with i of x of x is f of i of x which is f of x so really f composed with the identity function of on x is the same with f for all x belonging to the domain because the identity function takes us to the same set which takes us to with to the same function f the same identity function can be defined on the codomain y so in this case, if y of y is equal with y, y i 
of uh, uh, the identity function composed with f of x is the identity function of f of x. f of x is equal with f of x, and the identity function will just be f of x. So here we have the function f applied to uh, basically the identity function applied to the function f of x. So first we have f of x, and then the function y, which maps i, that map, uh, the identity function that maps y to itself. And basically, we can see that f composed with the identity function on x is the equal with f, and the identity function on the codomain composed with f is equal with f. Now, inverse functions. So if there exists an inverse function because the original function was one-to-one -one and onto function, then the inverse function takes us back from the codomain to the original domain. So now f of minus 1 composed with f of a will be f of minus 1 of f of a, which is f of minus 1 of z, which is equal with a. So it's f of minus 1 composed with f of a is equal with a. f of minus 1 composed with f of b in the same way is equal with b. And f of minus 1 composed with f of c is equal with c which basically brings us to the fact that f of minus 1 composed with f is equal with an identity function on uh, x. Also, we can do it in the similar way that f composed with f of minus 1 is the identity function on uh, y. And this can be proven in a similar manner. So the composition of a function with the inverse is that if a function is one-to-one -one and onto function, then uh, the inverse function will f of minus one is defined on y with values on x, and f of minus one composed with f is the identity function on x, and f composed with f of minus one is the identity function on y. The proof for the first part, a, uh, the first part, A, is let x be any element in the domain, then f of minus 1 composed with f of x is f of minus 1 of f of x, which is an x in the domain x. The defin by definition of inverse function, f of minus 1 of b is equal with a, if and only if f of a is equal with b for all a's and b's such that a is a member of x and b is a member of y. So f of minus 1 of f of x is equal with x prime is equivalent with f of x prime is equal with f of x. But since the function is on to, uh, 1 to 1, it follows that x prime is equal with x. So really f of minus 1 composed with f of x is equal with x. So we just remember that and we use it in the last step. So f of minus 1 composed with f is equal with identity function on x. Similarly, we have the uh, basically the second uh, part of that proof, that f composed with f of minus 1 is the identity function on y. I will not show that. The proof for that it uses the onto function. Next theorem. If f and g are functions defined as we have them here, f on x with values in y and g of on y with values in z, and they are both one-to-one -one functions, then g composed with f is also one-to-one -one function. The, met the proof is through the method of direct proof. So suppose that f and g are one-to-one -one functions. By the definition of one-to-one, -one, it means that suppose that x1 and x2 are members in the domain x, such that, that g composed with f of x1 is equal with g composed with f on uh, uh, x2. By definition of functions, it, uh, composition of functions, it means that g of f of x1 is equal with g of f of x2. By the fact that, that g is a one-to-one -one function, since these two are equal, it means that f of x1 is equal with f of x2. By the fact that f is a one-to-one -one function, those two are equal if x1 is equal with x2.
So if the compositions are equal for x1 and x2, then x1 must be equal with x2 for any x1 and x2. So this basically proves that G composed with F is also one to one. And compositions, and here is an example. So this is a one to one function. This is a one to one function. And the arrow diagram shows us that this is a one to one function, basically given arrow diagrams. Composition of onto functions. And if F and G are onto functions, then G composed with F is also an onto function. So suppose that F and G are onto functions and Z is a particular but arbitrarily chosen element in Z, in the codomain of G. Since G is an onto function, that means that there is an element in Y such that G of Y is equal with uh, Z. By the definition of F is onto function, since for y, there must be an element in x such that f of x is equal with y. We can replace y with f of x in the previous formula. So we get that z is equal with g of y, which is equal with g of f of x, which is equal with uh, g composed with f of x. So for any, uh, basically for any z, there must be basically an x such that and let me move this figure a little bit up so you can basically see it below the proof so for any z there must be an x such that uh, g composed with f of x is equal with z which basically proves that g composed with f is also on top and here is an example both f and g are on top for every element that you have in Y, there is at least one element in X. And similarly, for every element we have in Z, there is an element in Y. And we can see that the composition is also an onto function. That's everything about functions that we want to cover in this chapter, these subchapters one, two, and three. And today we'll take an hour to do exercises with functions. So I will take any leftover questions, which I see that there are none. So let me stop the recording so I can post it later.